Welcome to Tobacco Online Policy Seminar Tops. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Xi Shang, a tobacco control researcher at Ohio State University. Tops is being organized by myself, Catherine McLean from Temple University, Mike Pasco from Georgia State University, and Justin White from the University of California, San Francisco. Off note, today is Tops' one year birthday. Thank you for supporting TOPS and helping to celebrate the series birthday. The seminar will be one hour with questions asked by the moderator and discussant. The audience may post questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments meeting seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available, along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, toptobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Catherine McLean from Temple University to introduce our speaker. Today, Dr. Paul Rodriguez Lesmes will lead a ground rounds presentation entitled Tobacco Policies in Informal Economies. Dr. Rodriguez Lesmes is an assistant professor in the School of Economics at the Universidad del Rosario in Bogota, Colombia. He is currently a member of the IHEA Board of Directors as the Latin American representative, a member of the LA CEA Latin American and Caribbean Health Economics Network, and a regular contributor to the Colombian Institute for Health Technology Assessment, the Colombian Fund for High Cost Disease, and the Inter-American Development Bank. He holds a PhD in economics from University College London, 2016, and worked with the World Bank and the uh, Institute for Fiscal Studies in the UK. His research focuses mainly on the area of health economics in terms of policies associated with health behaviors, healthy behaviors and chronic disease prevention, demographics and child development, regulation of health markets, such as pharmaceuticals or personnel, and financing and universal coverage of health services. He also works in the area of areas of applied economics, uh, such as education and informal labor markets. Our discussant today is Mike Pesco. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez Lesme will be presenting his research in two segments. We will have a pause after each segment to allow for questions. Dr. Rodriguez Lesme, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for the introduction, and and C. Shang and Dr. White for for uh, allowing us to present the the results of a of a wide agenda that we have been exploring during the last years about the tobacco policies, not only in Colombia but in several countries of a uh, of the continent, in the region. So maybe I will share my screen from this moment on. So. As Catherine was saying, this is tobacco policies in informal economies. So we will go into this topic of, uh, of informal economies in, into a second. First, the disclosure, which is always important. The funding for all these projects has come principally for the Global Alliance from Chronic Diseases, which is uh, an initiative by the, the IDRC from Canada. And some of the projects also have some involvement from the American Cancer Society. Cancer Research UK and uh, others with the like a local uh, grant fund that is the, from the Colombian government and the World Bank that's known as Alianza F, which is inclusive and formal economics. No? So neither of, uh, of any of the authors in, in this in any of these projects uh, have received any funding from tobacco related industry. If anything, or some of them will be from the other side, like a uh, policy side uh, and um, general society initiatives to try to control tobacco. That, that would be the, the disclosure for these projects. So tobacco policy in formal economies, why? First, there is this uh, general trend in the declining use in tobacco use and the rise of the new forms of um, tobacco like uh, like heated products or electronic cigarettes and so on. But still the topic of tobacco control is quite important in many of the middle income countries. So there are countries where the prevalence was still growing for, 
for the year 2015, for instance, what is what you see on this graph by Hoffman and co-authors uh, in BMG. Why it's different in informal economies, apart from these potential differential trends? Essentially, because there are a lot of complications when trying to first measure tobacco control policy related and even consumption. And second, because it's hard actually to implement the policies that all that uh, everyone knows that work, like uh, the ones included in the Framework Convention of Tobacco Control, the FTCTC. Right? And informality per se, essentially that businesses are not registering like uh, information in the official systems. It could be in terms of labor, which is the, the graph that we, we have here in the map, or it could be in terms of taxes, or it could be on following the procedures, for instance, in terms of the amount of cigarette that you are selling and for which type of population and where they come from is a central issue in a lot of countries, many in Africa, many in South America, many in Asia. And that's why we care about this. So the first project I want to share with you is uh, related to taxes and crowding out. So the topic of taxes and crowding out has been explored for a while in, in the literature, especially in the development literature, thinking that putting uh, like pressure to households in, in order to reduce the smoking um, like uh, behaviors can be due in terms of tax of tax of taxes. What is the main issue? The, the main issue like or some of the arguments that are uh, against this type of policies is that this is putting a high uh, cost in terms of budget pressure for households that have very low levels of income. So if it's very hard to actually reduce uh, for some type of households, their actual levels of consumption of cigarettes because it's an elastic good uh, and so on, then this will end up reducing the amount of, uh, of resources that households have, for instance, for education, nutrition, and health. And that uh, has been uh, like a, a worry in many countries. There is evidence in China, there is evidence in Indonesia, Vietnam and in other countries that this happened some time ago. So what here we will explore is what happened for the case of Colombia between 1997 and 2011, where we see a reduction in, in prevalence because there it was an increase in the size of taxes. Taxes and like didn't grow that much in this period, but actually we do see an increase in the price of a of uh, cigarettes on real prices of cigarettes of around 30, 40% in this 14 year period. And what we can observe here in this, um, sorry, where I have the mouse. Oh, okay, wait. Fortunately, so what we can have, uh, what we can see here in this point is that yeah prevalence went from 22 to 12 percent around all the income quantiles which what we have here but for the lowest quantile in this period the proportion of the budget dedicated to tobacco went from three percent to six percent for the lowest quantile right so then this is the exactly what uh, what the concern is it's like there is for households who still were smoking the proportion of the expenditure that went into tobacco double in this period. So how this affected all the other type of expenditures of the house. So what we do here in this case with Professor Gallego and Guillermo Paraje is essentially to assess how this affect using a simple difference in difference a style of analysis. It's not a difference in difference, we're just assessing differences across quantiles and checking what happened over time. It's more a descriptive type of analysis. He's seeing how it changed the levels of, uh, of the share uh, of the budget related to health and education. The interesting bit is that in these areas of, uh, of, of expenditure, actually the numbers reduce over time. So by 1997, 10% of the budget of a household was related to health and education something happened with the with the legend here the black bar is 1997 the green bar is 2011 
And in 2011, this number dropped to 4% for the lowest quantile of income of the or expenditures of the of the country. For and this happened for every level of income, even for the for the wealthiest households. The reason is why. The main explanation here is that at the same time that we saw that expansion in terms of the of the taxes and general policies related to the tobacco framework convention, we also see a dramatic increase in the health insurance coverage and in the access to secondary and primary education. So what happened is that essentially education and health become free and accessible for everyone in the country. And this will be very important because the pressure that we really expected to happen in terms of a budgetary pressure because households now are devoting more of their income into buying more expensive uh, tobacco products is not going to affect the areas of health and education exactly because the social policy is expansion. No? What we're doing here with this regression is just to have these budget shares on the left and having us controls um, the, the quantiles of income if you want and then to see the difference between smokers and not smokers. This is kind of the standard of this crowding of the stats. What is the main element here? That of course there is a composition effect because households are, we saw a, a quite important reduction in, in the prevalence of, a, of a smoking in the country. So what are we are doing is first to do a matching strategy to ensure that we have more or less the same type of households in terms of composition. Composition of the household might lead to different budget shares per cent. And in that way, we assess if there are actually differences apart from this graph. But as you can expect from what happened in this graph, we do not see any sort of impact in terms of uh, increasing uh, or the differential increase uh, in terms of uh, of the or reduction in terms of the budget shares for health or education. Well, it, where we observe reductions or a differential trend over time, if you want is in terms of leisure and clothing, which is what it will be expected at this point. So our conclusion in this case is that given that we have this expansion in terms of social policy, which is not restricted to Colombia, it's happened well, more or less in all countries in Latin America, and in the middle income countries in the world, then we are safe of uh, doing a quite a large expansion in terms of taxes. And, and that uh, is the main conclusion of this analysis. It's more a descriptive historical analysis, if you want. This is the first uh, project that I wanted to share with you. The second is move on the next 10 years. So the, the previous uh, finish in 2011, this one starts in 2012 more or less. And he's thinking on the new strategies that the country adopted. Since 2020, there is this feeling that we need to adopt the, the framework, the tobacco framework convention, but uh, it actually took a, a, a while to be implemented. 2011, there were the first uh, attempts. We will see later at the end another project anal analyzing this time in 2010. But then in 2016, 2017, there was the major increase in, in, in taxes in the country, which was quite large. Here we have the average price of a pack of cigarettes in Colombia at that time was around $1. And the excise tax was half a dollar, so more or less half of the price. It, it started lower in 2017, and in 2018, it, it, it doubled the excise tax at some point. So the graph only finished here. In any case, what you can see on this graph is that Colombia has the, at that point one of the lowest prices of tobacco in the country. You know? So this is the price for Chile and this will per stick and this is the price per stick in Ecuador, which is our southern neighbor. So Colombia really need to do something about increasing taxes of, uh, of um, tobacco products. But one of the main like arguments of the industry is so we have a real control, a real problem trying to control our borders. Essentially, we don't have borders in, in reality, if you want. So this, uh, what you have in this uh, figure here, is, was part of the, of the study conducted by Fundación Ana showing that uh, 
the smuggling of cigarettes and whatever good in, in the country was easy is just to go on, on a road with a big truck. It's nothing very complicated and you bring whatever product you want into the country, right? So then the argument of the industry, the informality is, uh, or is a, a big issue. You buy cigarettes everywhere in without any of, of the, like of the requirements by, by the law and so on. And if you like uh, go on with this increase on taxes, then we will be full of, uh, of um, illicit cigarettes in the country. That's the argument here. And it's the argument in most countries in the world as uh, research by PESCO and others have, has shown that there is this systematic uh, like um, message uh, from the tobacco industry. So our question was, okay, let's measure the increase in the penetration of illicit trade in the country, right? What is the main issue with this? The main issue is that data for this is, is basically inexistent, right? So illicit trade per se, of course it's illicit, so there is no administrative official data on this. We need to do some sort of our strategy to measure it. So the idea of, uh, of the project by Fundación Anas, directed in that moment by Blanca Llorente and Norman Maldonado, was to measure the illicit trade penetration by doing a geographic survey in several cities, five cities in the country, 60% of, of the market, where they assessed in 2016 the presence of this sort of cigarette, basically visiting an area, for instance, this neighborhood, and finding out everyone who was smoking in the area and doing just a, a quick survey and checking if the cigarette and the pack, if they have it, actually was um, related to illicit trade. The easiest way to know it is either because the brand doesn't exist in the country, we don't have that many brands in the countries. If the package wasn't following the, like the advertising, like the warnings of the country, there is of course a list of pictures that are approved and so on in, in that way we, we can assess that. And the other is the price. If the price that they pay for this was extremely cheap, essentially it was cheaper than the actual tax that they have to pay, we know that it comes from, from illicit trade. So it was done in two years before the tax started and after the tax started, 2016, 2017. And they visit twice the same areas. Of course, it's not the same people, but it's the same areas trying to control a bit in terms of the composition and characteristics of, of the smokers, right? There is always an issue on selection that there, there is a reduction on prevalence, so it might change a bit. So the, this uh, strategy of collection try to address it. So what is the other problem? The other problem is that we don't have, a, in most of our countries, a state level uh, taxes, right? So we have, some other type of differences in terms of uh, subnational uh, policies and so on, but taxes are the same everywhere in the nation. So it's a standard strategy of comparing what happens in one, uh, in one state against the other, we cannot use it. If we say, okay, maybe Colombia is similar to Ecuador, to Peru and so on, but we don't have this sort of, uh, of service in every country. Now we have, there has been an effort in all of our countries to try to have a similar strategy as the one as I presented in Colombia, Ecuador, Chile, and, and Peru at this moment. But at that point, we, we don't have that sort of measure. So what uh, we try to do? What we have to, to do is to find some other sort of variation, and here was the price of the cigarettes. So essentially, as this is an excise tax, cigarettes, the cheaper cigarettes, will have a of uh, competition by the illicit products that are the ones that are coming into the market that will be very cheap, whereas the expensive cigarettes won't have this sort of, uh, of competition. Normally, the price of cigarettes is related, uh, so for instance, to the brand, if they are have some, some particular flavor and so on. But what happens in, in Colombia and in countries similar to ours, is that the price is not actually given by the brand, but the price is given mostly by where you buy the cigarette. The main issue here is that you can buy cigarettes by a stick, even if it's forbidden. And if you buy cigarettes by a stick, 
you are buying essentially cigarettes that are very expensive. So you will get very expensive cigarettes when you buy it on the streets by unit close to a bar, to a pub, and so on. This is what the survey shows. No, so essentially it could be the most expensive cigarette uh, in terms of brand could be in like uh, end up being cheaper than the plain brand if you want if you are buying them in the street instead to going to a large supermarket and so on so at the end this is the the variation that we are exploiting essentially we have the lowest third tile. This is uh, in, in this graph, the highest price third tile. And what we see is what happens in terms of the penetration of illicit cigarettes according to the price of sale that, uh, that people report. So what we observe is that for the medium, medium and highest price third tiles, essentially there is no increase in terms of um, the penetration of, uh, of illicit cigarettes that by the way was not, uh, that the market was flooded with products at that time, just 2% of the cigarettes that were found in these cities were coming from an illicit trade. Whereas in the shortest period, then we observe that there is an increase, an increase of around 5.1 percentage point in the penetration of cigarettes. For the country, as I was saying, this is roughly like one, two percent increase in the actual penetration of illicit trade cigarettes. And this was a major tax hack. So what we were saying here and, and trying to show to the government for the most recent uh, like um, efforts for increasing the, the taxes at this point is that look like illicit trade is not growing dramatically as you were expecting. It is increasing, it's expected to increase, but it's uh, relatively small. So we are safe on trying to keep doing this uh, this. Uh, so I guess this will be the first part of the presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, we'll have, if any of the audience members have any questions, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, but if not, I think uh, we'll have our discussant have some comments right now. Uh, sure, thanks, Catherine. Um, uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, so one question about your um, first paper. Um, did uh, the cigarette tax and the social policy expansions happen at the same time, or was there staggered adoption of those different policies? So in general, as, the, as this is 14 years periods, everything happened slowly. So the adoption of said the social policies were like actually started in 1991, all of them, but they finished the, like the process of expansion in 20, Oh, 09, more or less. So it's a 20 year period of a slow increases all over the country. And the, and the tobacco policies in general, most of them, like the, there were some small changes, but it was almost constant over time. Of course, the, the, the prices, the growing prices, uh, like went slowly, but we don't see any particular law that decided to increase during this period the, the taxes. Because you had, um, if I'm remembering correctly, you had uh, uh, data from multiple different periods in time. And so I was just wondering if there was any way to kind of tease out uh, uh, with using different, um, the surveys from different years, the effects of like some of uh, more of the tax, less of the social policy, or is the only real comparison you can do um, the final year of your uh, data that you have versus the, the first year? Yeah, like, um... We emphasize a bit on, on the last year, but uh, but so we can observe what happens every year and, and we discuss in the paper what happens every year, but um, it, it's really hard to get some credible variation so that we said this is a causal effect and, and so, mm -hmm. so that's why we keep it like a, a descriptive study in general. And I'm curious if you've thought it all about, um, so what would happen then for households then that uh, you're not tracking this 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 consistent uh, like baseline set of households, I don't believe, over time. And so it is possible that the households and they could stop uh, smoking, right? Um, uh, in which case there would be like these compositional changes in where households maybe are falling uh, over time as a result of the um, just just over time. And so do we have any like could certainly the cigarette taxes they might be affecting composition as well then right mm -hmm. okay 
for okay. the um, for the illicit uh, trade paper, um, I was curious, what are the uh, the tax rates in neighboring countries for Colombia? Um, are those considerably lower than uh, uh, in Colombia after the, the tax hike or have those always been higher? So in over like the period that uh, we're analyzing here, Colombian prices were lower than anything around. Mm -hmm. But uh, and prices, for instance, in the neighboring countries, like uh, were increased. I think about five years before before our study period. So, and there were the substantial increases. So one actually of the arguments that usually is uh, like uh, went up more on the qualitative part of this study is um, that the one of the main reasons why they didn't increase that much. Uh, the illicit trade is essentially because it was a lot uh, better idea to bring all the smuggling cigarettes through Venezuela, bring them back, uh, bring them down into Ecuador, which has a, a very large price of cigarettes. So apparently it was a good uh, way to, to earn money doing all this, uh, all this traffic. But in any case, you have to consider that the market of Ecuador is not that large. So saying that the only reason that uh, there was not a high increase on this is uh, because Ecuador was not profitable. It's, I guess it's too much to strain the argument. It's, it really doesn't, it's not that profitable in, in the country to bring uh, smuggling cigarettes in general. And that's uh, probably the main argument. There are some other results for, for instance, Brazil, that uh, apparently the, the last tax increases increased more the level of, uh, of cigarettes, but um, for our current prices is not a good idea. And that's it. Mm -hmm. that's it. So, so I was just wondering if there's a way to do like an alternative identification strategy it might be to try to exploit kind of like distances to lower taxed um, uh, sources of, uh, of, of cigarettes, right? So if, if Colombia had a border with a country with, you know, an obvious lower cigarette tax, it might be interesting to see how, um, uh, how um, your measure of the, um, the smuggled cigarettes, if, if you know, you saw a lot more of those smuggled cigarettes closer to that lower tax border or not, um, but it might not be that simple either. Uh, so I was just curious to hear your take on. Yeah, actually, so when we do go for the geographic variation, so one of the areas, which is the, the one from the photo is the border with Venezuela. And in that one, smuggling is, uh, is the rule on everything, in, like starting from uh, petrol, if, if you want, because it's a lot cheaper in Venezuela, or it was at that time, a lot cheaper in Venezuela. So um, what you observe is that in that city, there was a, a notorious increase in, in the penetration of illicit cigarettes, but it was very hard to say that it was due to the, um, to the tax, because at the same time, the Venezuela was having a lot of... Uh, of problems. So it, it is like the, the collapse of the Venezuelan economy started more or less at this year. So then whatever comes from Venezuela was a piece, uh, a good business from Venezuela because they, they needed cash in another currency that it was not the, the Venezuelan currency. So, so we comment this a bit on the paper, but we said we cannot really like uh, say that it's, it's the um, like uh, essentially uh, that is the tax reform because of, of this contemporary change in, in the situation in the other country. And uh, just one, one last uh, a comment, I guess. Um, I really like your, how you guys identified these, these likely smuggled uh, uh, cigarettes. I think that that's pretty cool. Um, it, it does strike me the, the lowest price church style here. Um, it does strike me as that is a pretty sizable increase though, right? I mean, that's a, it seems like about a 70% 70 percent increase right and i guess i think i think you're saying that that's not very large um uh, so i was just curious if you could elaborate more on 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 that yeah the, this has been always some of, of the elements of the discussion because relative to the time the, the prevalence if you want of these uh, illicit cigarettes is is high it's, it double if you it, uh, it, 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 it increased notoriously well actually in our in, in the estimate is uh, Yet it doubled from 5% increase, 5% percentage points. But this is the lowest third tax, so it's one third of the market, then multiply for this. And given the initial level of penetration, so saying that we doubled from 
2% going to 4% is not that much if we say that we double starting from 3% uh, going to 20%. So in that way is that we want to present the results to Ecosia because uh, we expected that uh, some people will try to say the, in, the setting, in the Congress and so on, look, they are showing that the, the prevalence of, of, uh, of illicit trade double. And that's uh, what we want to say. That, yeah, it doubled, but it's doubled from something that was very small initially. Thank you. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Mike, and thank you, Paul. Um, I, uh, audience members, please do feel free to um, put your questions in the Q&A, uh, but I think right now we can uh, return to the presentation. Okay. So now we move into another strategy is going from the, so we had, we started with survey with the secondary data and we went to this um, kind of primary data exercise. And now we go into a, a more experimental part of, of the project. So this is part of a large project that is uh, organized um, by Emmanuel Guindon and Manos Met the Sakis in like a very, coming directly from the central project from the IDRC, if you want. And we are what we are doing in the project is to understand the role of plain packaging in middle-income countries. So why it could be different? Essentially, because of the presence of illicit trade cigarettes, right? So apart from that, because you can buy the cigarettes by stick, even if it's forbidden everywhere, right? This picture that you have here on the right is the usual way on, on, you, on how you will get cigarettes in, in any city, more or less of this continent or this subcontinent, if you want. So people will be selling in a small box, in the street, many things, candies and so on, and cigarettes. But they will not be selling cigarettes like by a, a pack, but they will be selling it by sticks, right? And the main issue with this is that the sticks, of course, don't have any warning per default in, in our country and in many of our countries in general. So all the efforts on trying to design uh, like better packages and imposing rules will completely disappear when people are just buying the sticks. So we want to assess the role of or the value of having the sticks in, in the cigarette. The other is the presence of illicit trade cigarettes. So we were saying it is not that, in, like in the, in the case of Colombia at that point, the penetration was not that high, but there is always this discussion that it could suddenly increase magically. And that's the, the argument that's going on around the, in, the, in the Congress, uh, in, in, in Colombia, in Ecuador, in, in um, Chile. That's the three countries in, in South America where we are doing this study. The study is also going on in Vietnam and in South Africa. So the question is, okay, let's try to assess in a discrete choice experiment, the value of the plain package in this case will be this, plain, this sort type of uh, plain packages we're using the Canada design here in comparison to the standard design that we have in each of our countries. So it changes in, this is more or less the same here in Ecuador. In Chile, already is closer to the plain pack, but that, that would be a standard. With uh, some variations, we will allow for the presence of the, of the warning in the stick, and we will consider the presence of these alternative brands, like the illicit cigarette brands, that essentially don't comply with any sort of regulation. Let's see what happens. So what is the, the idea? Uh, what I'm going to show you here is the Colombian version, but the design is more or less in, in any of the countries. So far, we're, what we have done at this point is to collect a, a, pan, a pilot. So we have done several pilots, but this will be the largest pilot that we have done to be sure what's going on. The final survey that we will run this month, uh, and the next one is uh, as an online task for 1,200 uh, individuals. We have piloted here, we have piloted in, in Canada initially to, to assess the, like to check the, the design that things were working. 
with the original design, and now we are piloting it as well uh, in Ecuador, in Chile, at this precise moment with the students. The idea is to have the, the, the design for, in the, for smokers 18 to 45, but as well for non-smokers 18 to 21, to understand a bit the role of a uptake of a smoking and, and similar. We have three attributes, the price, so we have three levels of prices, the package, which could be the plain and the standard, and the cigarette that could be branded and with a and with a war, as I was mentioning. We will have three blocks in the, the, the block one and block two is like covering it, the, the design, actually, this factorial design is to, to get these characteristics and their interactions as well. So we in order to, to get it the optimal design that we get is to have these seven that we'll have seven choices. And in a block three, we will have no illicit trade available. So a normal choice experiment that you will see is essentially showing these three packs. Actually, the third, the, the third pack is a mistake because the third pack should be the, the illicit trade cigarette always present there. But in the block three, we will have a, a version where it's just another of the, of the original packs here with some of the variation. Apart from the discrete choice experiment, where people can choose which one do you prefer in terms of price and so on, or none of them, there is an opt-out option, and which do you think is healthier or not, we have a hypothetical option at the same time. So yeah, initially, this was going to be essential, and we were going to give something in a, to have a, the, the action not to be hypothetical, but to be an actual uh, auction, but uh, given the, the restrictions of, uh, of COVID, we have to do it, everything hypothetical. Right? So it, uh, the design is to be used in, in a tablet at least, or, or in a computer, but um, most of, uh, of these we expect to be in a computer because of the, of the panel survey that we are hiring to the experiment. So what are the, results up to this point. So essentially, from for this pilot, we have for the blocks one and two, we have 87 respondents, these blocks and one, two, we have the presence of illicit cigarettes there. And for the block three, where we don't have illicit cigarettes present in as, a, as the potential choices, we have 24 individuals. Nowadays, with the current prices, the package uh, is to Two and roughly two and a half dollars. So you see that it actually increased for this one dollar in 2016 to nowadays. And what we observe is that the willingness to pay for the branded pack derived as after doing a conditional logic estimate for this is around $389 when we have the illicit trade cigarette present and to $57 when we don't have it present. So some of the first, um, at least on this pilot results that we have, it's, it's a pilot, but it's not that small as a pilot. Only for smokers, we also have the origin for non-smokers, which is a bit different. We observe that there is an increase in the, in the willingness to pay on the presence of these illicit cigarettes. So actually, illicit cigarettes is shifting the, the design, the, the results. For the warning stick, we have, that actually it increases a bit, the, or there is evaluation for, for not having the warning in the stick if you want, but it's very small. And actually when we don't have the presence of illicit cigarettes, it's, it's uh, smaller than this. The block three is smaller essentially because we're randomizing into the three blocks. So it's equal the probability that you enter in any of the three blocks. And that's, uh, that's the reason. So blocks one and two it should be joint. The joint of them should be double the size of block three. What happens when we do the auction uh, analysis? So when we go into the auction, essentially we are getting willingness to pay it a lot smaller than what we're getting at this point of three eighty nine dollars. So here we are getting um, roughly half a dollar for avoiding the plain package version of it, and for avoiding the warning of cigarette actually is closer to what we get in, in this exercise where the illicit trade is not present, right? 
So this is the current state. We're still trying to figure it out well. And hopefully with now with the full information from the study, we will check why it is changing the evaluation on the presence of this uh, extra alternative illicit trade cigarette. Main characteristic of illicit trade cigarette, apart from the looking, is that the price is notoriously smaller. It's a third of the price of the, of the actual package. And, and we're having differential prices in the equation for the lucky strike that we have there and for the illicit pack. But still, we see these differences. And this is the, the situation. So any, any comments, any suggestions on, on what to consider on, on this, it would be highly appreciated because we, we expect to go to the field in, in a couple of weeks for this. Great, really exciting work. Um, uh, audience members, please do uh, put any questions or comments in the Q&A. Um, I think we have a question from Si Shang. Uh, she has a question about the block size. Uh, block three has a smaller sample size. Is that by design? And if so, why? Yes, it is by design. So we, so we randomize on these three blocks. And um, given that if you have the probability to be in any of the three blocks to be the same, then the block three and this have to be the small. That's, uh, that uh, was the idea. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, and I'll save our discussant, uh, Mike Pesco, if he has any questions at this time. At this time. Uh, thanks so much. Um, Paul, please continue, this is really exciting. Okay. Now the last project that we have is on the normalizing smoking in urban areas. So this is more join, like going into urban studies. So here what we have uh, this project again with uh, Juan Miguel Gallego, which is the, the, the leader of, the, of this project in, in Colombia, of the tobacco control project in Colombia, and with uh, Susana Otalbar, who was our research assistant at that time. And, and, uh, and this was part of her MSc dissertation, or it, this was her MSc dissertation. So what we wanted to understand was the role of the command and control policies. So, so far, everything has been more or less about uh, prices, presence of illicit trade, and so on. We wanted to know more this, so, this other type of strategy. So what happens when, when actually there is a prohibition to smoke in bars and restaurants? This has been explored in the literature. There are some nice uh, stories out there discussing this. But again, we are in a context where it's very hard to enforce anything. As we saw before, enforcing the, the um, prohibition of selling by sticks didn't work. It doesn't work anywhere in, in, uh, in South America, more or less. So how we could expect this to work, like the prohibition in, in bars and restaurants, if more or less half of the bars and restaurants are informal uh, entities? So they pay some of the taxes, they comply some of the norms and actually the capacity of the government to enforce that all these uh, norms are actually enacted is, is very low. So here the strategy was, the strategy was very different. And it, instead of say, moving the police into the, into the bars and restaurants to try to, to enforce it, what we do, what the, they do was to try to do some um, some meetings with all the associations of bar and restaurants and uh, convince them, in this case, it was the Ministry of Health, that it, this was a good idea and actually it was good for the business of, of bars and restaurants because the prevalence of smoking was low, relatively low, and many people really didn't like uh, didn't what at that point that the, when they enter into a bar and restaurant, they, the place would be full of smoke. These meetings, work. Unfortunately, we don't have data. They, they work, so there is no sort of baseline measure at that time of how many bars and restaurants allow people to smoke inside. And then afterwards, what happened is that before some institutions were trying to do this, before of the actual implementation in the law in 2010. So this was more an expansion on, uh, on what it was the norm in terms of the country. So given this, we want to understand how it affected the smoking prevalence. 
Again, this happened for the entire country. There is no variation of any other sort that, that we can exploit. The only variation that we can exploit is how common it was for you to be exposed to this idea of, of bars and restaurants full of, um, of people smoking. So here the concept was to exploit the geographical proximity of households to the commercial hotspots. So essentially the idea is that, that is what we have in this uh, diagram here, is that you have a household that could be far away, away from a commercial area, and you have a household that could be close to a commercial area. You can say, okay, perhaps the one that is closer to the commercial area is more exposed to the social norm of uh, people smoking all the time because they are near places where people smoke all the time, bars and restaurants. That's the first idea, which might work or might not work. Second idea is to keep the design of, of this comparison. So you have people being close and far, but what it will change is to this place that is uh, the closest to your household, if this is a very high density area or not, because places with a high density of this type of, of businesses, bars and restaurants, will have a lot of, uh, of um, people smoking and, and it, like as a so social norm, it would be more important that places where this is not a, that, a, that large. What is the main issue with this? Is that of course, these things are not random. It's not that the density of commercial areas and the distance is randomly allocated to a city. Not that this hotspot responds to the optimal allocation of businesses in, the, in an urban area. The nice thing here is that, again, given the, the informality, but now in, not in terms of business, but on the urban planning and, and the usage of, uh, of the areas, places are not uh, like uh, in, uh, in, in the Latin American cities are not like, this is my residential area and this is my commercial area. Normally they are mixed. So you can get a house and this house will be very close to many type of commercial areas. Some of them will be high density, some of them might not. And the growth of the commercial densities uh, actually depends on, on some other factors that might not be related to the initial decision of where you have uh, decided to live. Essentially because you can do it by like, so it's very easy to do a commercial area without it being a law by law that is going to be a commercial area. So we really exploit this, um, this variation that it was commenting, the distance and density of commercial areas, but keeping into account the location of, uh, of the households in two years. So actually very close years, 28 and 2011. We have a couple of surveys at this time that were collected a very low level of, of uh, geographical areas in the city because they were trying to assess some characteristics in terms of transport of the city. So what you have here is the map of the city and the locations of all the blocks that were surveyed by the city, by the service. Other characteristic of this is that these surveys are done in, in stages to get the representativeness, but a block is surveyed entirely. So the survey firm, or this is the, the government survey firm, goes into a block and enter a block and goes through all the houses of the block. So the information of prevalence here, prevalence will be on whether the household is buying tobacco products or not, essentially will be given by that all the households in the block, uh, given what, uh, what they report, essentially. And that help us in terms of thinking if we have only one house per block and so on, no, we have the entire block more or less survey. So this is what we have. And what we happen essentially, this is a different difference. We are just comparing the prevalences of, uh, of the blocks the, before the implementation of this ban, then the implementation of the ban and what happened with the prevalence. And we have a, that there is a reduction in prevalence. What is the issue? The number is very big, nine percentage points, but it's very big because it's very highly precisely estimated for 4.6 percentage points. So it could be one, two, or it could be 20. It cannot be 20 because the prevalence was 20. But uh, 
but this is what we're getting. So we roughly believe more into the direction of what happens at the, than the size of the point estimate. What happens, we see that the impact is actually concentrated on households with kids under the age of five, on households that have a skilled workers in general, right? And that these uh, qualitative results doesn't depend on how we define to be near, what, how we define high density. We also try some sort of placebo exercises. We, we randomly allocated the definitions of being near, being far, and so on. Again, as in the first study, what we are trying to keep is the composition of households more or less constant across the block. So we also imp implement some uh, matching strategy here. This is a different different. We cannot actually assess parallel trends. This is one of the sad parts of this study. This very nice geographical study only occurred in, this, in those two years and a year later or in 2014 and so on. But that's uh, what the data allow us to do. Yeah. So the conclusion is that the band work, it actually contributes to reduction in prevalence in the country by changing this, uh, this social norm. That's, uh, that's the summary of, of this uh, last study. Great. Um, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, do we have any questions um, from the audience? Please, if so, please uh, put them in the Q and A. Uh, if not, uh, Mike, if you have some questions, then that would be great. Uh, yeah, um, uh, I really like this uh, this last uh, uh, study quite a bit, uh, Paul. Um, uh, one, um, I know that you only have two uh, waves of uh, of data, right? Um, and so that, you know, that presents some challenges in that, it you know, we would like to do the, you know, the explore the parallel trends assumption using a, a longer pre-period. One, one thing that I was wondering if you've done this um, that I'd be curious about is, uh, or it seems like over this, this time period, um, perhaps the, um, uh, there was compositional changes, again, kind of like in the types of people that live closer to these commercial um, establishments. Um, and so I was wondering if you've done something like uh, use pre-post as the dependent variable and then regress all of your uh, control variables uh, to see if there were any changes kind of in the demographics in the in, in the post period. I guess maybe you'd have to interact that with distance as well or, or something like that, but basically to try to see if there were any compositional shifts like that. Okay, like uh, that is exactly of, of uh, Like a balancing kind of balancing them. exercise. Okay. But the balancing part we had done. So initially, as, as, as I was saying, the, um, so the type of households that are close to, to commercial areas or high density commercial areas changes you know, there because of the design of, uh, of cities in general. So there was an initial uh, problem, or if you want, like a phenomenon of, of the household being different, there is no balance. So what we did for this was to Again, ensure that uh, we have comparable households into into decision, but uh, changing the weights of the households into the sample. How we do the changing the weights with a propensity score match? So mm -hmm. essentially, what we are doing at the end is this matching difference in different strata. How if it changed the the composition in in the second year? So what we observe in the balancing is that they it doesn't change but probably it's a good idea to have it explicitly as an outcome variable to see, to see what happens. That, that we haven't done that part as well. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and I guess with, with the uh, propensity uh, score matching, it, it, it did seem the, the results in some cases differed a little bit from whether you use the propensity score match versus, versus, um, versus not. Um, I guess the, the key thing would be just making sure that the variables you're using your propensity score couldn't themselves be directly impacted by the, 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 the policy, mm -hmm. right? So I was just curious what variables do you've used kind of for your propensity scores and um, if those are exogenous variables. And these are in general demographics, like uh, the presence of children, if the, like the age of the household head, uh, the, um, <clears throat> the income quantile, if you want, but we try to avoid things like, uh, for instance, the sector that uh, you are working on, if you have a business, 
because uh, it said if this law perhaps have a kill some uh, restaurants because it was the restaurant of a smoker, then it might have some other type of effects. And so we try to keep restricted mostly to demographics. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, we have a couple of questions uh, from Mike Cummings, so I'll just read them both. Uh, were there studies done to look at indoor air pollution levels since the goal of a smoking ban is not denormalization, but rather reduction in indoor smoke exposure? Uh, and then following that up, in the US, the studies that support denormalization are primarily impact on uptake of smoking in previously non-smokers. The impact on adult smokers was more likely to, uh, likely on amount smoking, not prevalence. Is there a way to look at this in Colombia? Yeah, so we, we were going more into this, that uh, perhaps we expected younger individuals to, to smoke less. So the, the impact to be higher for this uh, sort of individuals because we, we didn't expect that, uh, for instance, adults will stop smoking or people who were already smoking for a while were going to stop smoking, but that the new cohorts of say, the adolescent and children that were going into into the decision to smoke or not will change uh, their path because of this. We, we were going on these lines. We don't find evidence of this. And, and the real problem with this is that the survey doesn't tell us exactly who is the smoker in the house. And that's um, one of the big limitations of this. The sad part is that for one survey we know, so for one survey we have individual uh, responses of whether they smoke or not but they decided to remove the question at, at some point in time. And they, they added and removed the question on smoking uh, a lot in this, uh, in this service, in this household service, we don't know why. So actually this part of the advocacy work uh, here in the country is trying to be sure that every time we have this sort of information available. Yeah, and the first question was on, sorry, can you put that Let in? me go back here. Uh, were there studies done to look at indoor air pollution levels since the goal of a smoking ban is not denormalization, but rather reduction in indoor smoking exposure or smoke exposure? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like um, that is the, the part that we cannot really see what happened in the, like the direct effect, if you want, so that people respond, have you been exposed secondarily to smoking, for instance, that, uh, that sort of question is not available. There is, uh, there are some studies available for this, but they are very far from the from this change. So we, we didn't want to extrapolate that much that uh, a 10 year difference would be only for this, uh, for this sort of, um, of norm. This is because we have more or less three years between the two surveys. Thank you. I uh, just want a couple questions from C, uh, and then uh, if, you could, don't go on, if you don't mind going back to the DCE. Uh, she has a question about the willingness to pay for branded pack is $2.39, which is a significant amount. Does that measure the preference for branded package when plain package or branded package without plain packaging? Uh, which package represents illicit products? Okay, so does the measure the preference for brand package with plain packaging or branding without plain box. Okay, the, the number that was given was the preference uh, for the branded package with uh, with plain packaging relative to the branded package without uh, plain package. So this difference is what we are measuring. For the illicit package, we are not uh, changing the, the, the design. So the design of illicit package is always the same because we don't expect it to, to change. Like there is no way to change this uh, and so on. So what we are doing here is just to leave it like an option that, uh, that may shift the preferences of people. That's a, uh, or the willingness to pay the preference of people that, at some point. Okay, great. Um, I think we have one more question from the audience. Uh, C's gonna save her, question, her second question for later in the follow-up. Uh, just a question from uh, James. Preacher about the illicit trade study. You said about half of cigarettes are bought as singles. Singles are typically more expensive per unit than cigarettes in packs. Uh, so would your methodology for identifying illicit cigarettes potentially miss a lot of illicit singles since they wouldn't be caught by your price screen and there's no packaging to examine? Yeah, there is no 
package to examine, but uh, what we have in the data is that normally they will have the brand in the in the stick. So we will know or we can ask directly that if this was an in-person service, not the littering strategy, or so it was a person survey to ask which brand is the is the cigarette directly. So that's why we know it. And we ask the person exactly the price of, of, of the cigarette. There is a, a possibility that the price is, is, is relatively wrong and so on, but this price on, could only be higher than the price that said the, the street vendor bought the initial package. So if, if the price was actually cheaper after that markup uh, from the original, or the original cigarette, so we definitely are sure that this should come from illicit. Uh, we are out of time. Thank you, Paul, uh, for the presentation and to moderator and discussion. Finally, thank you for the audience of 75 people for your participation. Thanks again for participating and have a top notch weekend. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation for letting us uh, to share this project. As, as you see, like um, we're scratching <laughs> more or less the data from what we got, but it's the like the important thing from trying to help into the discussion and uh, into the policy designs in these countries. So that's uh, what I wanted to share with you. Thank you, Paul.